open your Bibles to the Old Testament book of Ezekiel. Uh, there, among those major uh, prophets of the Old Testament, uh, we're going to read here in just a moment uh, chapter 2. So the book of Ezekiel, uh, chapter 2. Today marks the 245th, I believe, if I did my math right, 245th anniversary of the signing of what we uh, identify as the Declaration of Independence. Fifty-six very brave men uh, signed about a 1,300-word document which brought, in a sense, to a, a sense of codification, uh, later to be expanded and, and more articulated in the United States Constitution, but put into black and white at least a part of the vision that some English settlers brought to this land 170 years prior to the signing of this document. To be sure, those first English settlers that came and established Jamestown and Plymouth Rock came because they believed that the conditions in which they were living in Europe were not conducive to the expression of of their faith in an almighty and a sovereign and a good God. And so while we find many today that want to erase and rewrite uh, the history of this land, make no mistake, those first settlers that came to what we now know as the United States came not to establish something of a a new industrial or commercial site, but came for the sake of expressing their faith, their confidence in a good God. And now, after 245 years plus, we find those in this land that are maniacal about erasing and rewriting uh, that which is the definitive witness to the goodness of God in terms of the history of this country. And so I wanted to turn us to the pages of Scripture that reflect the ministry of an Old Testament prophet that spoke in a time that was difficult. A time in which there was great tragedy, great violence, great upheaval. And yet God called him to speak his truth in the midst of a troubled world. And so I want us to think today because I think that just as there was a call upon Ezekiel 600 years before the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, there is a call upon the church today to speak prophetically to our world, to speak God's truth, to call to repentance, and to announce that there is indeed still the good news upon which we may be saved. So think with me this morning as we begin to read about a prophetic voice in a profane land. Verse 1, And he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. And he said to me, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to a nation of rebels who have re rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. Uh, the descendants are also impudent and stubborn, and I send you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, 
And whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, be not afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns are with you, and you shall sit on scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor dismayed at their looks, for they are a rebellious house, and you shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house. But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Be not rebellious like the rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. And when I looked, a hand was stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it, and he spread it before me. And it had a writing on the front and on the back. And there were written on it words of lamentation and mourning and woe. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for your truth. Your truth is always your truth. It is always true and it is always applicable to each and every circumstance, to each and every culture, to each and every condition. I pray that you would give me the ability to rightly divide and give uh, those who hear the ability to rightly hear for the sake of your name, for your own glory, and for our good. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Out of the many things that I struggle with on a kind of a daily basis in terms of preparation uh, for the proclamation of the Word is the, the struggle to place some type of, of title on a message, a, a, a title that something somewhat reflects what we want to be uh, studying in a given week from a given uh, text of Scripture. And I must be honest with you, I have been rather proud of this week's title in that we will say a word about what it means to be prophetic uh, in our day, but let me just simply say that it has always been incumbent upon God's people to be those who speak God's truth, in season and out of season. So at the very least, I mean that God's people must speak God's truth. And we now live, and it was interesting as I tried to choose the, the, word, the second important word in the title, a profane land. Like many of you, I simply Googled the word to see what it meant. I thought I knew what it meant. I've uh, got a, been accused a time of being a bit profane. But, but in its kind of technical usage, it means to desecrate that which is sacred. And I thought, aha. That describes our day. A day in which the, the sacredness of our humanity is being desecrated in so many different ways. I don't have to spell it out for you. That, that the truth of God and His Word revealed to us is being desecrated. And so even though those things are a reality and create for us a hostile environment, an environment in which the truth is simply not welcome, we must continue to speak God's truth. Truth that is good for us and truth that is good for God's people and truth that is still good for the people of this world to hear. And so as we think about Ezekiel and kind of the man and his message, we must be reminded that I nor any of you have the mantle of the Old Testament prophet. We are not receiving direct revelation from God in the way that the prophet Ezekiel did and later the apostles uh, received. We have the completed Word of God by which we may speak the truth both to the church and to the world in which the church is planted. We do not live in Old Testament, Old Covenant Israel. And I think many mistakes have been made over the history of this, uh, this country, trying to make a parallel between the United States of America and Old Testament Israel, and there's really not a parallel. 
If there is a parallel, it's between Old Testament Israel and the church. Okay, and then you have to even be careful about making your comparisons there. But we need to understand that Ezekiel was called to speak God's truth, a truth that God and Ezekiel knew would be entirely unpopular. For those of you that uh, come on uh, Wednesday nights to our Bible study, and you should, okay? One of the, the fun things and the helpful things for me has been our walk through the Old Testament historical narratives. And it, it has allowed me to increasingly to, to make sense of the entirety of the Bible, the context of the, the New Testament, and, and to understand uh, what these prophets were dealing with. And we know the, 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 the story of Old Testament Israel and God's deliverance from that great nation, from the, the land of slavery in Egypt, and God's establishing them in Palestine, in Canaan, in the land that He had promised. To the, to, to the great patriarch Abraham and how they came to live in that land and how their comfort set the stage for their drift, their pursuit of apostasy. Ultimately, uh, that nation that God had delivered on the wings of, a, of eagles uh, in that, that land entirely rejected God. They divided into two kingdoms, a northern and a southern kingdom, the northern kingdom would be destroyed by Assyria in 722 B.C. And in one sense, it was a warning to the people of Judah, of that southern kingdom, that God is serious about what He has said to you. If we are to remember uh, the, the old covenant stipulations, the, the promises and the curses, God said, I am going to bless you, and everything that it will mean to be a great nation shall be yours if you will obey me. And I will be delighted to, to, to share with you the great privileges of revealing my, me throughout the entire world. And you will be great economically. You will be, be great militarily. You will be great socially. And that will please me. But if you choose to rebel against me, if you choose to violate the, the standards, the stipulations of this covenant, I will delight in bringing terror upon you. I will destroy you and I will disperse you out of this land. And so God did that to that northern kingdom in 722. And essentially, those people disappear from history. They, they, they are never reconstituted as a people again. And yet, the citizens of the southern kingdom did not understand the warning. With few exceptions, namely the, the reign of that young and godly king Josiah, there was a time, a, a, a short window of revival as, the, uh, as the, the, uh, the law was recovered and proclaimed and there seemed to be, at least at some level, repentance in the land. But soon after the death of Josiah, apostasy reigned. Idolatry was rampant. And following on the heels of men such as Isaiah, Jeremiah came on the scene to be followed by Habakkuk and this prophet Ezekiel, and they proclaimed the truth of the Word of God. Jeremiah specifically saying that because of your sin, because of your rebellion, you are going to be exiled, you're going to be deported. There's going to be 70 years that the people of Judah will not be privileged to live in this land as God's punishment, as God's discipline to reorient and to restore you. You, you must go into Babylon. And the radical, the crazy message of Jeremiah was you should go. If you fight and you stay here in Jerusalem, you'll be destroyed. But I have established a, an incubator. I've established a quarantine there in Babylon, and you will be preserved there. Why are you going to be preserved? So that that stump that returns shall produce a righteous branch 
the fulfillment of the prophecy made to David of a king that shall come from his family. That's why I'm preserving you. And so we find that this prophet Ezekiel, the deportations have begun, beginning in about 605 B.C. Probably the young prophet Daniel may have been among the first to be taken uh, to Babylon. And if you look at chapter 1 of the book of Ezekiel, you'll find a very specific dating of when God began to call upon Ezekiel to train him and prepare him to speak his truth. Now, the incredible thing, and I don't know if this is right or wrong, but at least one commentary said the date is July 27, 593 B.C. Now, for those of you that have been around here for a while, July 27 is the occasion of two very important dates. I won't tell you what they are, but if you ask me, I'll tell you later. But July 27th is very significant, okay? I'll just say that. And so, whether that's right or wrong, and I don't know, uh, in the 30th year probably of Ezekiel's life, he was a priest, the time that he would have stepped forth to be a priest, five years after the king was deported uh, to, uh, to Babylon, he begins to receive the revelation of God and that first revelation begins there in verse 4 and it's it is something that's almost beyond our imagination beyond our description but like other apocalyptic type visions it is his attempt to describe what God revealed to him of his glory of God's glory now let me make a distinction here no man will ever see the essence of God. But God on occasion, at least as recorded in Scripture, reveals something of the visible glory that emanates from His essence. And that glory in and of itself is captivating and overwhelming and stunning. And Ezekiel sees it and begins to describe it. And he is overwhelmed with the reality of the maj majestic holiness of of God, and at least partly that vision of the greatness of Almighty God is what establishes him and prepares him to go speak that which God has called him to speak there as a captive in Babylon, there along what is identified as the Kebar Canal, there in southern Babylon, north of Judah, there uh, in the midst of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, God had sent these Jewish exiles to live until the time that he would call them forth and bring them back to Judah. And so Ezekiel is a, a prophet of the exile to those who are exiled. He is preaching his message, first of all, a, a word of explanation to these exiles. This is why this has happened to you. So that you will understand when those Babylonians go around and sneer at you and laugh at you about your God that we just tore down His temple, we just destroyed your holy city, we just took your artifacts and we are playing games with them. Our God is infinitely greater than your God. You may know that God has a purpose for this and He is still the God of gods, the greatest of all gods. And the same thing is true to us today. That is, as we speak God's truth in a culture who says that God and His revelation to us is inconsequential, that it is wrong, that it is damaging, that it is dangerous, we can still know that our God is still the God of gods, the one true God, the one God who has revealed to us how we should live and how we may stand before him one day with confidence and certainty. So we look here and we see first of all the prophet's call. There in chapter 2, the portion I read, Ezekiel is addressed as the son of man. 
you recognize that's a, that's a title that Jesus attached himself to. Daniel appeals to this uh, same imagery. It, in, in, in the prophetic literature, we can see uh, it, it, it reminds us of the, the humility of man. But as Daniel takes it, and we see that it ultimately also has reference to the glory of of the ultimate Son of Man, namely Jesus Christ, as He rules and He reigns over all things in the consummation. And so, in speaking to Ezekiel, He says, Stand up, I'm going to speak to you. It, 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 at least to me is reminiscent of, a, of an officer in the military speaking to a soldier. Stand up, stand at attention, or in a court of law when a, a judge begins to announce a sentence, would the defendant please rise? something of that out of respect you stand and you listen to me and so Ezekiel stands and God speaks to him and he says I am sending you I am commanding you to go to the people of Israel the people of the exile the people that are living in Babylon the people that are under my discipline at this very moment and he uses four words in that one paragraph that describes the wickedness of the nation. He speaks of their rebellion, their transgressions, their impotence, and their stubbornness. They are indeed a rebellious people. These, these people that had the privilege of the saving knowledge of God, that, that had the... the the realities of salvation played out in their very history as they were delivered from Egypt into this land of promise. And yet they chose to rebel, to, to, to wickedly transgress the law that God had given them whereby they would thrive in the land. And so we see the command, the indictment, and then beginning in, in verse 4, the, the exhortation that, that you're going to go and here's what I'm, I'm going to say, or what you're going to say, and it's going to be difficult. That, that you're not to be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of their words. Don't be alarmed when people say and do evil against me. What an applicable word. The, the, the very words of sin and redemption and gospel and salvation and all of these beautiful words now are anathema in our culture. They're going to hate us for proclaiming these truths. And God says, don't be afraid, don't be dismayed. They are rebellious. And you speak my words, but what? They're going to refuse to hear. In other words, our responsibility of speaking God's word is not their response. Our responsibility extends and ends on our responsibility to speak God's truth without compromise. To know God's truth so that we may speak God's truth. Notice as it be, beginning there in verse 8 of chapter 2. Hear what I say to you. And again, I make a very strong line here. As New Covenant, New Testament believers, we're not see, receiving direct and new revelation from God. But we are because we have the Spirit of God being illuminated by that Spirit to, give, to have understanding of these 66 precious books by which God has revealed Himself to us. And we are to master those words so that they may master us, so that we may rightly divide and we may rightly proclaim both to the people of God and beyond. Okay? We, we, we speak the truth among the people of God, and we speak the truth to the unbelieving world so in hopes that they would be saved. And so, he is to hear what God says, and, and, and that's illustrated here, and we see this at least twice in Scripture, where the prophet is commanded to eat the scroll. We see it with Jeremiah, in chapter 15 of Jeremiah. 
We see it in Revelation uh, there in the, the final apocalypse that the, the prophet is given the scroll and told to eat it. I think, again, we, we, we want to rightly divide. We don't use wooden applications. That doesn't mean that I get salt and pepper and put it on my Bible and eat it. Okay? But it is an image that reminds us that we are to be nourished constantly. That we're to be constantly about the business of taking in the truth of the Word of God. And just as that which we eat animates our lives and gives to us physical strength, the Word of God that we take in will give us vitality and strength and give us an understanding to speak God's truth to a waiting world. And so he describes it as what? As bitter. As I come to understand the Word of God, and, and as I observe what we see going on in the world, there's indeed a sense of bitterness. A, a sense of, of, of great sorrow over what we see. And so we see that the, the prophet is called and he is going to be commissioned. If you look at chapter 3 beginning there in verse 4 again, go to this particular people. Go to the house of Israel and you speak what? My words to them. We were talking about this in Sunday school this morning. And at the end of the day, Tim Evans has nothing to offer you. Tim Evans has nothing to offer to a lost and dying world. Whatever adequacy, whatever sufficiency, and whatever efficiency that, that I would have only is that which comes directly through the Word of God as applied by the Spirit of God. That, that, that's the only thing by which lives may be changed, that God may be uh, revealed, that God's people may be encouraged and strengthened, but by which the world may hear the truth and be converted. It's not by my imagination or manipulations or, or any of this kind of thing. It is strictly by the Word of God, the testimony that God gives to us. And so he says to him there, beginning in, in verse 8, I have made your face as hard as their faces and your forehead as hard as their foreheads. If there's anything I've been accused of over the course of my now almost 63 years, is Tim, you're a hard head. And you can see there is a reality that God's people and those that would, again, speak to, to God's people and speak to those that are not God's people there is a sense that we must be biblically hard-headed. That we must be tough-minded. I spoke recently at a funeral, and I, I spoke of grit and grace. That we certainly live by grace. But at times, it is a gritty grace. It is, it is I will clench my teeth and I will clench my fist, and by the grace of God, I will persevere through because I know He will sustain me. In this, And so, Ezekiel, like so many before and after him, he was warned, you're going to a place where they're not going to affirm and they're not going to appreciate you. You're, you're going to be persecuted. You're, you're going to be spoken against. You're going to be rejected. But you go, and you go to these exiles, and you speak of what I've told you to speak. And indeed, they will refuse to hear, but you will have dis discharged your duty. And so we, we see there that, that uh, beginning in verse 12, what I call the prophet's context, this, this difficult world that he was sent into of, of a discouraged people, a people that rightly or wrongly had a, a view of God, and they couldn't figure out, wait a minute, we're supposed to be God's people, and yet all of a sudden... We're in servitude, and Ezekiel had to go and explain, wait a minute. The reason you're in servitude is in, maybe in one sense you're, you're uh, biologically and genetically related to Abraham, but you have not by faith entered in 
to an eternal and effective covenant with Almighty God. You have not been saved by grace through faith, so, so to speak. And you are indeed a rebellious people. And so he was sent to these exiles to speak this word of truth, to explain to them why it is this has come uh, to pass upon them. And as he contemplated the condition of his countrymen, and as he contemplated the word of God, we're told that he was overwhelmed, that he lived in great angst for seven days. And so we see the prophet's call, his, his commission, his, his context. Let's look, if we can, at the prophet's cry there beginning in chapter 3 and verse 16. We're told that God has said to him, you're a watchman. I've established you, and this is analogous to a sentry watching over a city at night. And so, you're, to, you're, you're there, as, in a sense, to function as a protectorate over these my people. And you're to speak my truth to these people. Again, they're not going to like it. I've already told you that. They're ultimately going to reject you and your, your message. But you're to go and you're to speak that message, and I'm going to hold you accountable for speaking that message. And I believe, again, as the people of God, as we speak the truth to one another, and as we must speak the truth in the world, that God is going to hold us accountable, again, not for the results, but for the content. Have you spoken my truth in your context? And so, notice how this is explained. Look at verse 17. I've made you a watchman. Whatever you hear from my mouth, you, you tell them as a warning from me. You, you tell these unbelieving Jews that this is why this has happened, and you warn them about worse things should they not repent. And so, as we think about this, we must speak a word of warning that is inclusive of an indictment and God's condemnation for rebellion against him. We must, we must warn all who will give us an opportunity to speak that this is, this is dangerous, that, that the trajectory we find ourselves on is the trajectory that will take us to ultimate destruction. And so notice here, again, verse 18, If I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way in order to save his life. That wicked person shall die for his iniquity, but his blood I will require. We cannot allow a wicked nation to say this is true when it's a lie. That we must warn that God says this attitude, this belief, this conviction, this is wicked. And I believe that God will hold us accountable for speaking the truth in the midst of this very profane land. Look, let's go forward just a little bit. Verse 19. But if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness, or from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you will have delivered your soul. I'm not going to hold you accountable. You've told them the truth, and, and, and I, am, I am responsible for how the truth is applied to their lives. And then he goes on, verse 20, And again, if a righteous person turns from his righteousness and commits injustice, I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die, because you have not warned him. He shall die for his sin, and his righteous deeds that he's done shall not be remembered, but his blood I will require at your hand. Tell the people of God. Tell the people of God when they're departing from the truth, warn them. And if you don't, you will be accountable. Reminds me of what the Apostle Paul says to the Ephesian elders. I've declared to you what? The whole counsel of God. I, I, I have, I've not held anything back. And now because of this, I'm innocent of the blood of all men. And so I believe as, as the church that we must speak and live 
the truth. And that, that in, in doing this, we discharge the duty that God has assigned for the people of God forever. To speak His truth, to represent Him, so that indeed we will be innocent of the blood of all men. That, that the messenger is accountable to God for speaking His truth in all places at all times. And everyone who hears that message will be accountable for God or the hearing of that message. Well, I want to look at a final issue this morning, what I call the prophet's consolation. He's given the Word of God. He's sent to the exiles. He's told they're going to rebel. He's told that it's going to be tough, that there's going to, there's going to be briars, and, 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 and you're going to, it's going to be like you're sitting on scorpions. That, that, that doesn't sound like a particularly pleasant experience. It's going to be difficult, but I'm sending you anyway. And I'm holding you accountable to be faithful in these difficulties. But as you go, look at verse 22. And the hand of the Lord was upon me there. And he says, Arise and go into the valley, and there I will speak to you. And I arose and I went into the valley. And behold, the glory of the Lord stood there. In a sense, it, it reminds me of Jesus' promise found in the Great Commission. I am with you even until the end of the age. That, that is, again, make no mistake, we're not a prophet in the sense of Ezekiel and these other Old Testament prophets. But I believe that the church, kind of like uh, we the the corporate body of believers inherits the, the priesthood of all believers. There's a sense where we inherit the prophecy of all believers. We have inherited the revelation of God, not just for ourselves and maybe for our families and a few close associates. We've inherited the prophetic mantle to speak the truth of the Word of God, both in season and out of season, speak it in the church and outside of the church. And the Lord our God, will be with us. That, that, that whether it is received warmly or rejected harshly, it will be, we will be protected. We will be guarded. Christ will go with us just as He promised. That doesn't mean that hardship won't come to us. Again, we can see in our text. Ezekiel had a difficult time. Had a very difficult time. Many before him had a difficult time. Many after him had a difficult time. But our charge is what? To be faithful to speak God's truth. And I, I can imagine no other time, certainly in my lifetime, where the culture is at a level of hostility I never could have imagined. Okay? That, that, that the, the idea of truth is, is a strange notion to them. The notion of absolutes, the, 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 the notion that there, there is a God that does anything less than just celebrate their foolishness is a strange thing to them. That is our context. But God has called us, go forth and speak my truth. Do not allow people... To be deceived. He, he says in here that they'll know a prophet's been among them. We can't, we can't guarantee the repentance of anyone. But they can know that the truth has been spoken. And so we must go and we must speak this truth. The interesting thing about Ezekiel, the first half of the book, Ezekiel is, is telling them, this is why God has done this. This is why you're under judgment. You're a wicked people. And then in the second half, he begins to turn. But God is going to preserve you. In other words, he delivers the bad news for what? The sake of announcing to them the good news. And so, we speak the truth of both the bad news, the indictment, the condemnation. That is true. We also speak the good news of a gospel of, of a savior who saves and and forgives and restores and redeems 
And we've, come, we've been called to this work, to this time. I, I mentioned a few weeks ago Mordecai's words to Esther. We may bemoan the time in which we live. It's tough. I don't like what I see. I'll just be fair with you. But just as every other follower of Christ, we have been born for such a time as this. We have been given, in a sense, a prophetic mantle, a prophetic call for such a time as this. We have been given God's truth for such a time as this. And so we must speak and we must live that truth. Albert Moeller has recently published a couple of books, and I'll just kind of close with a kind of an allusion to, to them. He is a, 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 a fan of Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of England during World War II. Churchill wrote a work called The, the Gathering Storm, describing what was going on in Europe in, in anticipation of World War II. And Moeller, in his latest book, he has titled it kind of as an homage to Churchill, The Gathering Storm. And I want to say to you, there is a gathering storm. If, uh, if, if you look at what's going on around us, there's a storm that's gathering. And we're not going to be able to hide. We're either going to speak the truth or we're going to deny the truth and again, deny the one who is truth incarnate. And so there's a storm gathering and then to borrow another title from Moeller, we cannot be silent. We cannot be silent. That just as Ezekiel and these other prophets that have been preserved for us spoke and were rejected, and they were persecuted, and they were ridiculed, so we too must be prepared, must anticipate to speak an unpopular word, a misunderstood word, a word in which people are going to malign us just as they malign the Word of God and the God of the Word. And so, I believe, I believe the church, I believe the people of God, that one of the things that's incumbent upon us is that we do speak this prophetic word in this profane time in this our profane land. To this we are called. Pray with me. Father, thank you for your word to us, a word that is eternally relevant, eternally applicable to us. Lord, as we think about what lies ahead, what is our context? We see the rising tide of hostility. We, we see the, the absolute anger when any type of reality of biblical truth is expressed. But God, again, to this we are called to speak your truth to, in speaking it, to not allow those to believe a lie and to make the claim that what they believe is the truth. I pray that you would equip, that you would strengthen, that you would prepare us because you have again ordained that we would be here for this moment. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.